It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. And now, please welcome our most special guests, the new Ig Nobel Prize winners. This year's winners represent four continents. And here they come. Hello and welcome to episode 341 of Science on Top. Today is Monday, the 23rd of September, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And composer and sound designer, Peter Miller. Hi there. And the only reason we can do this show is because of the generous donations from our Patreons, people like Sandra Lang and Christine Bain, who have been valued contributors for a long time. And if you also want to help out, just hit scienceontop.com slash donate and join up there. Really appreciate that. But now let's begin with the Ig Nobel Prizes. This is our favorite episode of the year, I think. Oh, 100%. <laughs> These were presented last week at Harvard University. They're the awards for science that first makes you laugh and then makes you think. And first up is the Medicine Prize, which was awarded to Silvano Gallus for collecting evidence that pizza might protect against illness and death if but not the pizza <laughs> if the pizza is made and eaten in Italy. It's an oddly specific finding there. Uh, what happened here? How does this work? I like to think that the reason for the Italy um, qualification is because they just haven't done enough international research. It's because definitely we know not because Silvana Gallus <laughs> is Italian. Is Italian. <laughs> it's definitely not that. <laughs> Do you reckon yes. Silvano likes pizza? Is that, is that your, your <laughs> read on things? He's done a lot of pizza research. I mean, there, he's there's done several mm. papers on it, so he's he's committed. Do you think it's a case of we need a reason to get funding that covers the purchasing <laughs> of pizza for our team on a regular basis? <laughs> um, Clever. That's the state of science these days is that <laughs> scientists are scrounging around for pizza and that's all they yep. need. Right. He should be going where the real money is, you know, climate science. You know how they Ooh, just get yeah, so it. much money. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But it's interesting you say that he's done a lot of research on pizza. I wonder if this is just – we've talked about how science is getting more and more specialised as we go by. <laughs> is this he's just narrowing down to pizza? What are the benefits of one particular food type? It yeah, looks it like seems that way. from the article I read, though, that he was looking at Italian diets in general mm -hmm. and pizza is a part of this – Italian diets and it it seems it could be not so much that pizza per se is um, necessarily healthy but that it might be more healthy than other typical foods or you know it might sorry to be more specific it might cause less of a cancer risk than other foods that are typically eaten in an Italian diet or that people who do eat pizza are more likely to be eating that Mediterranean diet, which is often, you know, lauded as quite a healthy way of eating. Like, um, so I'm sure it's not quite as ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> as it sounds like a pizza research, but it's, it's interesting. He also suggested that pizza consumption is, um, a good indicator for preventing or at least not causing heart attacks, but it doesn't seem to have a role in sex hormone related cancers. So there has been quite a lot of um, pizza interest. So I haven't read all of the articles <laughs> in the studies. <laughs> You got um, as far as pizza and went, I'm hungry. I'll do the research yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to see if I can replicate. And then, yeah, we, and then we need an Australian. An oh. Australian cohort. I think we've got to shift the... Fact-finding mission to Italy? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah, there is that. <laughs> or we could just go to Ligon Street, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've eaten a fair bit of pizza in my lifetime 
and I'm still alive. So right. that's pretty well, concrete evidence there, isn't it? I feel, okay. though, and I don't want to, that maybe the pizza that Italians eat in Italy is of a different quality to the pizza that I get at, like, 9.30pm from the pizza <laughs> shop up on High Street. Just perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think you might be onto something there. I think maybe he specified Italian pizza to exclude certain very well-known um, mm, chain pizza brands. Chains? No, I'm yes. not going to mention any names here, but maybe that, that's why he's basically saying it's got to be a properly made uh, A proper pizza. pizza. Mm-hmm. And actually, when I've been to a fancy Italian restaurant, often the pizzas there, they're not like drenched in cheese and this and that. Mm. Like they're quite almost like flatbread with a few toppings rather than a full-on what I... vegetables. Yeah, veggies and... And I think he mentions in one of, in one of the papers it's actually mentioned pizza and vegetables. Mm, mm. So he's kind of... Inclu- he's being a bit inclusive of other things there. He does actually say, or at least in the, the, um, the article, he's quoted as saying pizza may in fact merely represent a general mm. indicator of the so-called Mediterranean diet, which has been shown to have potential health benefits. Um, which makes sense because the people there are probably eating in large numbers the Mediterranean diet. So, uh, yeah, he also said that uh, I thought it was interesting. All the patients, uh, all, all of all, all of the research pertains to Italian-made pizza metabolized in Italy. So no one left. No <laughs> you one can't <laughs> leave the country. <laughs> So is this about is this a big pizza story or or a, an Italian tourism story? I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. We're going to see who who is actually kind of funding him. That'd be an interesting thing to look up. Yeah, is it big Italy <laughs> or big pizza? <laughs> I'm kind of in favour of both, really. But uh, yeah. I think we should we should say uh, the dose makes the poison. And there's nothing in this research that I'm aware of to suggest mm. that more pizza consumption <laughs> reduce your risk of anything. It could just be that people who have uh, a good balanced Mediterranean diet will eat pizza, but not in the huge quantities that mm. we often see in more Western yeah, right. diets, I guess, maybe. Also, I suspect that this isn't kind of like the sort of study where they exclude everything else by making their, um, you know, their, mm. their control group eat only pizza and nothing else for... <laughs> six months or a year or something like that. So, so they're obviously taking it in consideration with other factors. Mm. The, 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 um, the, the studies themselves seem to have a lot of hedging in them. Like some of the, the, uh, the quotes are, regular consumption of pizza, one of the most typical Italian foods, showed a reduced risk of digestive tract cancers. And there's another one which is, um, suggests that pizza consumption is a favourable indicator for preventing or at least not causing heart attacks. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of means that no one who was in the study actually ate pizza and had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no guarantee uh, that these findings will hold true for foreign pizza or for any <laughs> pizza eaten anywhere by foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So don't go to don't rush to Italy and eat the pizza and think you are at least not causing a heart attack <laughs> because you're a foreigner and therefore it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> that's that's unfair. I know. Yep. <laughs> I guess the uh, the takeaway, if you will, of this research. <laughs> oh, I see what you <laughs> did there. <laughs> is to eat a balanced diet, including the five main food groups, which apparently include pizza. In Italy. (laughs) (laughs) Let's move on to the Medical Education Prize, which was won by Americans Karen Pryor and Teresa McKeon for using a simple animal training technique called clicker training to train surgeons to perform orthopedic surgery. (laughs) This is sending off alarm bells already. I mean... That's the limit of the training that these surgeons are getting? I like to imagine that they actually did stand in the operating theatre and use the clicker, <laughs> but that's actually not the case. No, it turns out that the um, one, of the, one of the people involved is an orthopaedic surgeon called Martin Levy who um, has uh, some experience with dog training using clicker techniques. Um, but what, in fact... 
they did with the with this and he got the idea he thought he starts thinking to himself <laughs> maybe we can actually kind of use this technique to improve the performance of our surgeons so um it's really a case of positive. what if we treated our surgeons like like animals? dogs <laughs> right <laughs> So it's really a case of, of positive um, affirmation when you made the right kinds of did the right kinds of things when you're act, make, doing operations like saying "good job" and stuff like that. Mm. No clickers involved. Good job for not causing or or uh, no, what was it uh, for preventing or at least not causing uh, a heart attack <laughs> with your surgery? <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> you fared as well as pizza. <laughs> It's kind of the opposite to how I always imagined surgeons would be training. Like, you know, every time they cut the wrong part, the patient's nose lights up and there's a buzzer sound. This is kind of the opposite. When they don't do the wrong thing, there's the buzzer sound. That's a good point. That's a good point. So you're saying that that, that game, that surgery game is, is actually training bad wrong. behaviors. Yeah. Training them yeah, wrongly, totally. yeah. Training them to fail. Yeah. So next time, if you're going to go under the knife, you should first ask your surgeon, when you were a kid, did you ever play Operation? <laughs> In all seriousness, no. The, I mean, the, even though it is a dog training technique, the idea of using positive reinforcement and emphasising positive behaviours is a big thing in education. Like, it's, it can be really tempting. Like, our first instinct is to often say, oh, here's the things you did wrong. But yep. someone may not realise what they've done right, necessarily. And instead of making it a big emotional thing, like, okay, stop what you're doing, you did that good, when it's a really, I'm guessing, hopefully quite a fluid and to become an almost automatic movement, like using a drill or something, to just have a neutral little, yep, 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 without an emotional engagement could be good. Yeah. Especially yeah. given I, the article I read in Scientific, Scientific American said that there's a saying in training, without tension, there's no retention, in that it's negative um, feedback, like, oh, you made a mistake, you did that wrong, to get them to remember. But we know that's not really great in how people work. So on the one hand, like, it does make me laugh to think of surgeons, which is some, you know, highly skilled workers being trained like dogs. On the other hand, why not have a little bit of positive reinforcement? <laughs> reinforcement? There's, a, yeah. there's a comment on, in one of the articles about a professor from Utah State University called uh, Susan Friedman who says that when your motive is to escape an adverse stimulus, such as shouting or ridicule, you behave only as much as you mm. need to. But when the motive is to get something you want, you do more than is needed. Uh, so, yeah. so perhaps that you know the positive reinforcement is actually causing people to, to uh, you know, to try harder or to feel that they are on the right track and therefore you know go go that extra little little bit. I think it's a really it is this is a classic um, ig nobel really, isn't it? it on the face, it, it kind of yeah. sounds very silly, but when you think about it, it's probably quite a quite a good idea. Do you, do you think they kind of went? further down the, the route of the dog training and kind of gave them a bit of a scratch behind the ear when they, when they got it right as well. <laughs> at the end of the at the end of the operation, yeah, a little, little pat on the head and a, a little bowl of kibble. Well, actually, it makes a lot of sense. I have seen TV shows where surgeons are asking to be scratched by, you know, a nearby uh, yeah. nurse or something. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so maybe that's what that's about. I just thought they were itchy, but no. <laughs> <laughs> They're after some opera and conditioning. They, and that's right, yeah. But I think also the clicker is kind of important as well because it's if someone's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, good job, good job, you're doing great, it can feel disingenuous sometimes. Yeah. It's Whereas if you know that if you do the right thing. the clicker. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't have any emotive side to it. Well, it, do, it, it did say in, the, in the, um, the stuff I read about it that, that they tried to keep everything very neutral. So it's really just a, an, a, one word of encouragement, like good, good. or something like good. that, you know, trying not to, to get fall into that problem yet. It says good, simply spoken in a neutral tone. <laughs> I don't know if that would work yet. Good. Just, <laughs> all right, fine. All, all that the, like passive a, aggressive. Or the flick of a, or the flick of a flashlight, but that kind of seems a bit problematic to me. It's like, what, what was that? It seems a bit disco. I can't see. <laughs> That's right. Stop shining that in my eyes. <laughs> well, it, it starts off with a lot of sort of medical biological things because the biology prize went to a team with members from Singapore, China, Germany, Australia, Poland, the USA, and Bulgaria for discovering that dead magnetized cockroaches behave differently than 
living magnetized cockroaches. <laughs> yeah, well, they don't move as much. <laughs> <laughs> I love that such a large international team were involved in this. It's like, uh, hey, we've got uh, we've got some research we want your involvement in. Oh yeah, what is it? Well, it's magnetized cockroaches. I'm in. <laughs> Actually, I know a guy in Poland. He'll be into this for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so what happened here? Had obviously they're going to behave differently. Like presumably. It's, a, it's, a, it's affecting the magnetic magnetic field of these cockroaches by being. Is it more like it's more to do with them, not the cockroaches' behaviour, but the the way the magnetic field behaved? I think because the dead ones didn't do anything; they just sat there. Um, <clears throat> but the mag <laughs> they just lay there, no legs wiggling or anything, completely dead. <laughs> well, that was the that was the key difference in the in you know between the live and dead, wasn't it? The dead ones just had no behavioural. Uh, no, at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I found it was so so uh, basically they were they were magnetizing cockroaches Ca cockroaches as indeed many other you know living organisms um have have magnetite inside them somewhere um in in a lot of animals it's in their brains in in humans as well apparently but in cockroaches it's actually in their bum um, so, so they were magnetizing the magnetite in the cockroach's bottoms, um, and then they were measuring the magnetic fields that the cockroaches then had for a period of time. And what they found was that the live cockroaches, the magnetic fields that they, uh, they could measure from them, uh, deteriorated over a couple of hours. But, uh, the dead ones, uh, the, the magnetic field deteriorated much, much more slowly. Um, so, you know, this, that, and they went on to explain why, and it was basically that the inside of a dead cockroach is more, more gelatinous. It's, it's more like a, you know, a soup because it's starting to break down. So, um, that apparently had an impact right. on the, uh, orientation of the magnetite particles. So, um, I, I just, I wasn't quite sure really what the point was. And it, and it seemed that it was more about, um, the uh, these researchers were, were quantum physicists, I believe, and and, and um, uh, I'm not really sure why they went with with cockroaches for this study. Apparently, there was some reference to there being <laughs> lots of cockroaches uh, of this particular genus in Singapore, where where, where the study was led. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm still a little bit lost, to be honest. Also, because no one cares what happens to a cockroach. <laughs> I didn't know it was possible to get a dead one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can. They are meant to be able to survive even a nuclear fallout, aren't they? So uh, the actual yeah. findings, though, were just kind of a side effect, weren't they? They didn't. This isn't something they expected to find. It was um, just s someone discovered that this was happening in the dead cockroaches. So, so it's yeah. not like not why they were doing the research in the first place. Well, now I really want to know why they're doing the research. <laughs> that's just... Well, yeah, something, something to do with the way that, that um, animals and insects align themselves to magnetic fields and, yes. you mm. know, how they locate themselves, I guess. Because that's sort yeah. of interesting. What I find interesting, though, is the, the reason why. And as you say, it's because the dead ones, they start to break down and so they get all sort of gelatinous. Because when I first read it, I went, oh, wow, so... The magnetic field dwindles on a live cockroach. Are they somehow doing something to realign the magnetite? Are they doing something to change their own magnetic field? But it's not that. It's just the breakdown process of the dead cockroaches. Well, I, I interpreted it as a reverse of, of what would actually happen in, in reality because the, the magnetite... You, the, the cockroaches normally wouldn't have their own magnetic field because then they wouldn't be re as reactive to the... To, to, to the poles so I, th I took it more as um, you you probably you don't want if you do accidentally get magnetized <laughs> you don't want that to hang around for long because then your butt won't tell you where south is <laughs> Fair. no that that actually makes a lot of sense so so maybe there maybe there's a kind of little patent we can have here on how to kind of disorient cockroaches Magnetic fields. Well, yeah. Strong magnetic That's, fields. Can you use magnetic fields to repel cockroaches then? If you have I, I, I'll bet I'm someone's sure there are, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure there's devices you could buy off late night TV that make <laughs> yeah. that claim for sure. Yep. And they'll cure your arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as well. <laughs>
but you've got to wear the tinfoil hat to protect oh, yourself, yes. of course. And right, like- yeah, otherwise, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, and the Ig Nobel Anatomy Prize was awarded to two Frenchmen for measuring scrotal temperature asymmetry in naked and clothed postmen in France. It's oddly <laughs> specific. I love how specific these Nobel Prizes get. I, I, read, I read all through this and I could not figure out why they <laughs> settled on postmen. Same. Exactly the same. It was like, were they just handy? Were they nearby? Yeah, um, it's like I couldn't. There's there's nothing that kind of says this is kind of p- pertinent to postmen. <laughs> so why did they choose postmen? Because well, I was thinking, is it because they cycle? Because I know cycling's meant to have an effect on fertility mm. and because scr- scrotal temperature is not as esoteric as it sounds. Because it, it as it sounds because it is linked to men's fertility and sperm production, and you know men who are trying for a child are told. To, don't wear tight undies, for example. Wear boxes. Like you don't want it to be too hot, or it'll cook all the sperm, basically. But yeah. So, but there wasn't anything really about riding bikes. No. That I no, could there see. Was, well, that, it there wasn't was, just postmen. They also did an experiment they on did, yeah. bus drivers. Bus drivers as well, yeah. and that kind of makes more sense because you know bus drivers are sitting down for sitting a long period of time. So that I could under, I can understand that, but the postman just seemed oddly specific, uh, and I guess because they didn't mention why, it doesn't mention no. in anything I could find. It doesn't actually sort of say, well, we chose postman because of this right. reason. Maybe to the French, it's just really obvious. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know that French saying, it's as hot as a postal worker's testicle? I don't know. Ah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't translate well, yeah. Maybe it's something to do with all those illegitimate children or everywhere, you know. It was the postman. So they're, you know, oh, they're, they're, yeah. legend, they're legendary. Well, there's no milkman anymore. <laughs> no milkman anymore. It's always the postman in, in oh. France. So what did they find here, though? They found that one ball is hotter than the other is that right a little on general in general yeah this seems to be the case they're either a, a average temperature between the two of them is the same or i think it was from memory the left 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 scrotal temperature was slightly higher you know in all the studies they found the left one is warmer but only when a man has his clothes on if that's correct yeah when they're naked same wow that, that's yeah, have we actually touched so, on that? Have we, sorry, have we touched? Have we touched on wow. the fact that that they did? There were a variety of, of experiments, and, and one of them was this. Uh, so they they had to stand, sit, sit cross legged, sit with legs straight out, um, clothed and unclothed, uh, and they took you know temperatures across all of these different scenarios, and they found that the if they were standing naked then their their uh, testicles were on average of a lower temperature, which makes total sense, I guess, especially if they had their legs slightly apart. You know, there's more, you know, mm-hmm. airflow, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if they were sitting on the ground, uh, particularly with a cross-leg position, then they're going to have warmer testicles on average. I'm sorry. But the I'm left one was slightly if, warmer. If you were one of these test subjects... You'd be like, you're having a laugh, aren't you? Okay, sit, stand, <laughs> cross your legs, touch your feet, do the hussy right. poke. Just stand still. And yeah. I measure your testicles while, while you do it. What? This thermometer on you there. Yeah, they, they, put, they put temperature probes on them, and they also use calipers to measure Ooh. the dimensions of each testicle, um, which uh, sounds uncomfortable at best. It does. I like it. In the, in the procedure, it says, after the proposed experimental studies had been approved by the local ethics committee. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is this ethical? I mean, is this ethical? No testicles were harmed in this research. <laughs> Are we going to use postmen? Oh, fine. Oh, fine. And they're all volunteers. So, so, so somehow or other, they, they got people to volunteer for this. I'm, I'm curious as to what that ad looked like. <laughs> <laughs> or did they just work, walk into the local post office and say, we've, <laughs> That's right. we've got money, for a laugh. you've got time, <laughs> and then to the local bus uh, uh, depot. Yeah. Maybe they recruited people by sending out letters, but they were intercepted by the postman and went, Oh, that sounds like fun. I'll do that. <laughs> and then the letters never got to the right people. Uh, maybe. I feel like we should move on because we've said scrotum and testicle far so too much already times. for one podcast. Yes. Yeah, true. 
The chemistry prize went to a team from Japan for estimating the total saliva volume produced per day by a typical five-year-old child. <laughs> so who wants to tell us how much saliva does a five-year-old produce? Un unusually, it was less than I had guessed. Only 500 <laughs> milliliters. That's two cups. Like, what? Anyway. Half a liter. Half a liter, that's a, a fair liter. bit. It is a fair bit. And yet, compared to the amount of saliva, like as the proud parent of a five-year-old. <laughs> it seems like a lot more, does it, Penny? It seems like it's so much more. Um, everything in Penny's house is covered in saliva, is covered. isn't it? <laughs> oh, and worse. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, even my computer screen is covered in fingerprints. I don't even know why. I don't touch it. Anyway, um, so, yeah. So, so how do they measure and why? So they used 15 boys and 15 girls to, to find out how much saliva they produced. Um, so they needed, they measured unstimulated saliva by just letting the kids drip their saliva for five minutes into a container. <laughs> so that's just... <laughs> <laughs> how much saliva they just made. But then also, um, one of, obviously, one of the main times we produce saliva is when we're eating. So they had to, like, eat, chew and spit, chew and spit. Nice. <laughs> I, I think this is one of those few times where it's easy to get children to follow your instructions. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> chew and spit. Spit it out. Spit all your food out. <laughs> yeah, they love it. I wonder if there's video of this. Well, it was the actual research was done in the eighties, and the um, the scientists' sons were actually some of the test subjects too. So, I guess. And and, and now grown up. Um, now grown. The, the, and, and and I love this quote. It's like the the sixty year old Watanabe was accompanied by his sons, now grown up, and producing an undetermined amount of stuff. <laughs> 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 There's more research to be done. Yeah. Get the uh, ethics for a it. follow-up study. <laughs> the Japanese oh. Japanese scientists have done very well in the Ig Nobels. They have. They, 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 they often get, do. Yeah, actually. pretty much every year for the last however long there's been someone from Japan has done pretty well. Actually, that's a very interesting point. This this study could easily have been one of those wacky Japanese TV shows. <laughs> Reality TV. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the only difference is they wrote down the results. Yeah, that's what science is. Science yeah. It's just writing down results. Uh, it's very cool. But is there a point to this? Like, why do we care how much a five-year-old generates saliva? Or is it just to confirm Penny's suspicions that it's a lot? Or disprove in this case? I, I'm not sure why. Well, that's got us thinking about why you'd want to do it, but mostly yeah. laughing about how they did it. <laughs> the engineering prize went to Iranian Iman Farabash for inventing a diaper-changing machine for use on human infants. Because uh, so it won't work on the diapers of other other species. Other species. <laughs> well, I would imagine other primates would probably fit roughly. Like I haven't studied but they don't wear diapers that too there. well, but. Can I, read you, can I read you the abstract from the patent? Because I think it pretty much says yeah. everything you need to know. And I think we need to just say that this is a US patent that was granted. This, so yep. If yep. you want to steal this idea, you're out of luck. So it's fairly short, but it's, it's pretty specific. So a washer and diaper changing apparatus includes a main chamber, a glass window, a seat, a leg holder, a safety belt, a diaper removing arm, a sprinkler and a dryer. The main chamber, the main, the way, the main chamber is configured to receive an infant therein. The glass window is placed on right. the top wall of the main chamber. The seat is movably coupled to the main chamber and configured for a placement of the infant on the seat. The leg holder is movably coupled to the main chamber and configured to support at least one leg of the infant. The, safe, <laughs> the safety belt is coupled to the seat and configured to retain the infant on the seat. The sprinkler is placed inside the main chamber and configured to spray water to it wash at least a portion of the infant. 
<laughs> least abortion. But, you know, if it rushes the whole child, so be it. So but be it, but at least a portion. That's right. <laughs> I just can't see that working with any other outcome than disaster, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this was ever actually built and uh, used, but I must say there's a diagram as well in the pattern, and it just looks like a very convoluted dishwasher, basically. Yeah. It totally looks like a dishwasher. I, I think that's and the idea. You, you put the baby in one end and it comes out the other end changed and clean. <laughs> but I'm not sure clean. That... <laughs> like a Jetson. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> one of those funny pallets just goes in there and all done. Yeah. All good. <laughs> There's no big sort of Mickey Mouse hands that come in on robot arms <laughs> no, and just no, washing. No, <laughs> no. no, that would be the parents, no. I think. Yeah. I'd like to see the face of the infant as the process <laughs> takes place, just to see what their facial expression conveys. <laughs> well, I mean, props for engineering thought and for actually trying to automate something that is obviously a a task that a lot of parents don't look forward to doing. Yeah. But... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Prime, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't see it on the market myself. But maybe there's room for improvement, and one day down the line, it'll be like in the Jetsons. You'll have yeah. a conveyor belt. They'll go through, come out, all smelling fragrant and sparkling clean. And changed, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we can upgrade to the adult model, where you walk in in the morning <laughs> out of bed and it just showers you and I dresses you. And, <laughs> and then you're off to work. I mean, you know, how good, good, how good would that be? The economics prize went to three researchers from Turkey, the Netherlands and Germany for testing which country's paper money is best at transmitting dangerous bacteria. Yeah. Insert jokes about dirty money and laundering yep, here. Yep. Dirty money, <laughs> money laundering. Uh, every, every article carried <laughs> that, one of those, you know. I just wish they'd included, like, lovely Australian plastic money. Plastic like, money, that would be exactly. Interesting. Thank you, CSIRO. Didn't make the cut. Didn't make the cut. Well, I don't know if it was necessarily like they were getting a representative sample of the world's currencies or just using what they had. Um, but they, mm. Well, they had no I pockets. <laughs> a handful of currencies left in a drawer were used. Which is pretty impressive still, given that, you know, the Netherlands and Germany, I'm imagining, are on yeah. euros and Turkey obviously isn't yet. But I think they had American dollars, some rupees. Yeah, they sterilised the money um, and infected them with um, resistant bacterial strains, including MRSA and E. coli, and then checked them after two hours. And in the second one, they actually handled them, that people handled them to see who transferred. Mm. I'm presuming that wasn't with resistant MRSA. But well, anyway. let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, yeah, the Romanian ones looked filthy and were the most filthy, um, all the strains survived and ended up on tellers. Interestingly, apparently the rupee and the Croatian kuna, I think it's pronounced, I have no idea, um, felt dirty, but they weren't dirty. Um, uh -huh. The E. coli could survive on the euro, but it didn't end up on people's hands. But the American dollar looked clean and crisp, but was a fantastic environment for MRSA. So there you go. Um Apparently, though, they've been contacted by banks to find out, like, what paper would be best, but that wasn't oh, wow. really covered by their research. Yes, yeah, it's like uh, <laughs> the one, the outcome from this study is is the obvious, well, so what should we use for money? Yeah. No, no, we didn't, we didn't study that. But then also, uh, <laughs> I feel like we haven't said, you know, a dramatic epidemic of antibiotic resistant disease carried by banknotes. So yeah. perhaps... Although it can be transmitted, getting something on your fingers, which you use, most people would probably wash their hands, is probably not such a big deal. Hopefully. Well, I mean, according to according to the study author, Voss uh, says, "I always try to use humor to explain that microorganisms are all around us, and that we need to wash our hands after going to the toilet." I myself am among the measly fifteen percent that does. No. So there's a, that's what he says. Now that shocked me as well. Um. Yeah. Is that is that filthy, is filthy people? 
It, well. It, well, it does. It, there is a, an interesting thing to be to be uh, gleaned from the research, though, and that is that idea that you know we are in co constant contact with things that can be carriers of certain kinds of, of bacteria and disease. So, and money is a perfect one to look at because you know pretty much all all the time that's changing hands, literally changing hands. Um, so it's it's. I think that's quite an interesting little side effect of, of that. Um, I also think it's a rather uh, low on the list of priority research to be using resistant strains of MRSA and E. coli and things like that. Yeah. Like, I'd maybe want to just start off with ordinary E. coli, ones that we can treat if you do yeah, actually something infect someone. Yeah. Why are you even playing with this and not in a hazmat suit? I mean, yeah. Maybe they were yeah. just resistant to some, but not all. Or okay, something. I haven't read the actual study. Yeah. But so American dollars were among the worst, were they? For MRSA. Yeah, yeah and because they looked right. clean. So really, they're dangerous. And <laughs> if you want, for your own safety, if you want to get rid of some of those dollars, I suggest maybe putting them in an envelope and sending them to us. We'll, <laughs> we'll look after them. Yep, That's okay. We have we proper, take care of proper equipment we'll, we'll to de yeah. Disinfect, yeah. D disinfect the money and put it to a good use. Yeah. I've got some but rubber gloves somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> the, apparently, the the Romanian loo was the worst. Apparently, this uh, this one, it, which has a polymer fiber in it, yeah. a polymer fiber in it to pre, to prevent uh, um, you know counterfeiting. Apparently, this this particular yeah. uh, money, um, all three types of bacteria still remained on these particular bills in large numbers after three and six hours, and it was the only currency that still produced dangerous microorganisms microorganisms 24 hours after drying so oh keep okay. your hands off romanian just definitely go pay <laughs> i'm not going to get paid in romanian <laughs> currency ever yeah. after that tap and pay i think is the way to go yeah yeah <laughs> but uh wow and american currency isn't that like with linen as well it's not yes, just paper cotton, or something so cotton and paper yeah that would obviously be part of what's trapping bacteria i imagine and cocaine assume, apparently assume so. <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're really, you're dicing whether you snort off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you really are. What you're getting into your brain could be wrong. Well, that's, I guess, maybe that's why you use high value notes because they've been handled fewer times. That's true. That's a very good thought. <laughs> <laughs> the Peace Prize went to an international team of seven researchers for trying to measure the pleasurability of scratching an itch. Now, my spell checker thinks pleasurability is not actually a word, but it, there are a number of dictionaries <laughs> that say it is. I think that's a word. <laughs> pleasurability. So how and why do you measure how good scratching an itch feels? And can we just say it does feel good? <laughs> so good. So good. So, I don't like the way they carried out this experiment by putting some kind of strange little fibre things oh, like on to make irritating people itch. Plant things. Yeah, that yeah. just yeah. Uh, itching made me, powder. <laughs> that, that made me itchy just by reading it. <laughs> so they they rubbed people with these, um, I think, cowhage spicules, which is a kind of legume that causes intense itching, um, and so and then to to induce the itch, and then they were allowed to scratch so they were able to then assess like how good scratching it felt every 30 seconds to rate intensity so like zero for 10 so the itch intensity and how good the scratch felt so apparently itch was perceived most intensely on the ankles and on the back um, the perception of your itch and how nice it feels to scratch it was less pronounced on the forearm and apparently the pleasurability of scratching the ankle was longer lived compared to the other two sites. I don't know. I don't think there's anything particularly satisfying about scratching an ankle because there's all those bones around. I'd much prefer like a good old leg scratch or back scratch. But anyway, whatever. Like <laughs> anecdote does not equal data. <laughs> so, yeah. But there is a serious side to this when we need to think. Um, like people with skin disorders like eczema or psoriasis can often have unbearable itching and it might be that there's specific kinds of nerve fibers or responses that do make it that do help to relieve that itch 
sensation. So it could be that this is one of the steps to, in a treatment that sort of allows those sensations to be relieved and provides, you know, some relief for people who are suffering from skin diseases, which I think are often also have a bit of stigma and revulsion. Like, you know, people think it's yucky or weird. Like, you know, think about how people with leprosy have mm. been treated. Like there's something about skin diseases that can be, even though they're often non-fatal, that they can be very distressing but not maybe taken seriously. And, yeah, so while I think, you know, rating, itching, it doesn't on the first blush sound useful, I can, when, I, when I was reading that, I'm like, yeah, actually, like it would be horrendous to have itches and, you know, especially if your skin is damaged, you can't scratch it without damaging it more. It would be great to, mm. to find out a way of relieving that itch. Mm. Yes, indeed. I think it's also good research for showing that volunteering for scientific research is not always a picnic. Sometimes mm. there's really uncomfortable stuff they <laughs> do to you and there is no way I would be signing up for this. <laughs> I like how this was, this was the Peace Prize. <laughs> the Peace Prize, yeah. Don't put itching powder on people and we'll <laughs> yeah. all get along a lot we'll get, better. We'll get on well, yeah. It's kind of like peace in another way, isn't it? They, they've sort of stretched the, <laughs> the definition there. Inner peace. Hmm. Inner, that's right, inner peace. Well, it's more, more sort of exodermal uh, peace, uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> The Psychology Prize was awarded to German Fritz Strack for discovering that holding a pen in one's mouth makes one smile, which makes one happier, and then for discovering that it does not. <laughs> so this is one of those great stories of a, a discovery made a, a while ago. I think it was like 1988 or something, wasn't it? Yeah. And then a more recent replication study found not, not the case. Yeah. And it's one of those things that's kind of like a, it's been a myth for, for at least that long, isn't it? Where, you know, as long as you just, you know, you fake the smile. Fake and, it till and, you make it. And you'll, mm -hmm. yeah, and you'll, you'll make it. Uh, and it turns out that there's no science to support that. But also this is the whole uh, replication mm. crisis that psychology is uh, talked mm. about facing. Because it was, it was part of one of those big meta studies where they looked at a bunch of Studies that we've just taken for granted and assumed are correct for a long time and we've never actually put them to another test. Uh, I think there were like 100 uh, papers that they tested mm. back in, was it 2017? And, yeah, they didn't get the same results, even though they followed the uh, initial study really closely. And Fritz Strack was called in, who did the original paper in 1988, he was called in as a consultant to work with this team to reproduce it. So that's interesting that we, we, we have this assumption that once we've tested it once, that's good enough. And that's yeah. not really how science exactly. works. Yeah. Do you want me to give a quick outline of, how, uh, of the actual test? Yes, because how does putting a pencil in your mouth make you smile? So they, so they tested putting pen, a pencil in the mouth in two positions. One was holding the pencil with your lips, which apparently produces a, sort of a, an almost frowning uh, expression on the face. Um, so sort of so sideways, perpendicular to your mouth. No, 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 like, hold, no, holding it, holding it uh, parallel, parallel. As if you're sucking floor. on the end of it, or um, no, no. So, so imagine holding a pencil uh, horizontally in your mouth, um, and and sort of with pursed lips. Uh, that's the uh, the frowning sort of face, and the the, the smiling uh, one is is holding it in between your teeth, which of course requires you to pull your lips back away yeah. from your teeth which is which is why it sort of uh, simulates a, a smile and then what they did was was in these two positions they had people rate the um comparative funniness of of cartoons so apparently the original study used far side cartoons um so classic I approve. That's <laughs> so. So they did not use far side cartoons in in the in the replication study because they suspected that far side. You know, it's quite a while since people have already seen far side. it. Have, yeah, people yeah. already seen it. Maybe it won't be quite so funny anymore. So they se selected some other cartoons that they pre sort of checked with people as to how 
how humorous they were. I actually think that's the problem with the study because I still find Far Side cartoons hilarious. <laughs> and I heard just the other day that apparently Gary Larson is going to produce new Far Side yes. cartoons. Really? Which is brilliant news. Yeah. Yes. I uh, actually – just to correct you, Lucas, there they actually did use Far Side for both. They just changed. They just used different panels, different cartoon panels. Oh, so they I used. See. It says oh. they they used the same cartoon series that was used in the 1988 experiments, but they selected different cartoon panels. So so they were actually consistent with that. Maybe they weren't as good. <laughs> and the, ra- the, the the raters had to reach a consensus that the, each cartoon used in the study was moderately funny. I don't know that Gary Larson's <laughs> going to be very happy about that. <laughs> right. Moder- or maybe moderately this is what led funny. deciding to do new ones. Yeah, I'll show yeah. you moderately funny. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> yeah, he read the study and went, no, I'm going to fix that. Moderately funny. <laughs> I'm gut-bustingly funny, and I always have been. Thank you for that pickup, Pete. Uh, yeah. Interesting thing with these kinds of experiments too, because there's, there's a lot of subjectivity in these things, so it makes mm. them notoriously difficult to, um, to to kind of get good results from you. You're actually asking people to respond in certain ways, so that means there's a lot of kind of floppiness in this kind of thing. So it's not it's not unusual that you get sort of results that are not consistent. But also, okay, so now the test has been done twice. That's possibly not enough times to say conclusively one way or the other well it clearly isn't because they both disagreed with each other this is maybe something that needs a third fourth or maybe even a fifth yep. replication before Definitely. we'll start knowing what the real trend is and, yep. and what's actually going wrong here after the new larson comics come out i think they need to, <laughs> they need to do another arm of this what if Apparently, they're not funny what if they're not very Apparently good <laughs> yeah oh, no, no, don't even don't even <laughs> Can you uh, – apparently uh, some of the participants in the in the replicated study actually figured out what they were being tested on as well. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> did they turf them? It, it doesn't say. It just says that I they did they take did. pains to not – oh, they did, so they excluded them? Yeah, they them? excluded them. Yeah. Right. Because that's going to make a big difference <laughs> to, your, to your results. The physics prize, the last one. This was won by seven researchers from the USA, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, and the UK for studying how and why wombats make cube-shaped poo. And I remember when we talked about this, I think it was last year, Lucas, uh, this was one of your favourites, wasn't it? Yeah, and, uh, and uh, it was uh, relevant as we had um, Dr. Pamela Gay staying with us in, in Australia uh, earlier in the year, and, and she was so intent on finding <laughs> wombat poop near where we live because we do get wombats on our property and around our property. And we did actually find uh, one wombat um, standing in the middle of the road one night, uh, scratching itself. Poor thing had mange. Um, but uh, so, so Pamela went out and got some photos of that wombat, but unfortunately it didn't poo for her on, on command. <laughs> <laughs> but she was... Hadn't she had was clicker training. <laughs> <laughs> She was really quite um, uh, keen to, to see this phenomenon in person mm. and, and, and yep. did not, unfortunately. That's very tragic <laughs> that she spent all that hope and hope and time. Well, I mean, it was one of her stated aims for coming to the country, so it's, it's a bit sad. But, uh, uh, so this study, they did find out why the, um, the, 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 the poo pellets, if you like, are, are cubic. Uh, and, and it's to do with moisture. Basically, um, that they have uh, the ability to extract uh, pretty much every last drop of moisture out of their poo. And then it, it, it is more inclined not to form the spherical shape that we know and love, um, but, uh, uh, but sort of come out in, in more rock-hard pellets. Um, so, so that's... You know, it's, it's all about poo. So it's probably something to do with our dry climate over here. Mm. And wasn't there also something about... Something to do with the shape of their intestines as well. Yeah, they change the shape or something to... Yeah, it does. Them. So, yeah, they said that the pressure in the intestine helps sculpt the feces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Seriously, modern art. It's not doing well. <laughs> <laughs> 
you, yeah. you got to think. You got to think though that there's some. There must have been some kind of evolutionary pressure on this happening, though. Huh. I mean, it's not like just a side effect. Do you think that that maybe there's a reason that this happens? So I don't know. Maybe the poo doesn't roll away or something, and they mark mark well, their they territory. Well, they use it as, as kind of communication. Yeah, it's to mark territory, and it's to sort of say I was here, and hmm. yeah, it's to stop it rolling around, isn't it, Lucas? Uh, well, we don't know, but basically they, they did find that the, the, the wombat has got um, quite distinct, they described them as ravine-like grooves in part of its intestine, which is, which is a lot stretchier than, the, the, than other animals. And they believe this is part of what shapes it into mm. the cube size, uh, cube shapes. And then the lack of moisture prevents it from collapsing into a, 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 a sphere. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Also interesting that apparently this effect is not as obvious in zoos as they feel that's likely described uh-huh. by the fact that the wombats have probably got more access to hydration at zoos uh-huh. than in the wild. Could also be what they're eating as well. Maybe they're not eating Maybe. whatever they eat in the wild. Yeah. Mm. Um, and also one of the researchers when they were accepting their award did point out that this is proof that you can put a square peg through a round hole. <laughs> Also worth noting, this is the second Ig Nobel Prize awarded to Patricia Yang and David Hu. Uh, Ah. They and two other colleagues shared the 2015 Ig Nobel Physics Prize for testing the biological principle that nearly all mammals empty their bladders in about 21 seconds. I remember that. I remember that. Plus plus or minus 13 seconds, which is a fairly large window. But but yeah, yeah. so good on them. Because they're the uh, relative to their bladder size, their urethra probably is 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 sized in proportion to that. So it doesn't matter yes. if they're like if they're a, 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 an elephant or a mouse, then then they they can they can purge the bladder in a similar time. Yeah. Frame. yeah. Yes. Plus, to do with I think the height that the bladder would be and then things like that, how fast it would come out and <laughs> well, it's like uh, uh <laughs> y- y- urine urine reaching terminal velocity from a, a larger animal <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they're um getting quite some uh, ig nobel notoriety for doing things to do with uh waste products i guess animal <laughs> waste <laughs> very good and so that's uh all the Ig Nobel Prizes from this year, uh, a, a good mix, I think. Some of them were quite, you know, true to nature of Ig Nobels. They made you laugh and then made you think. Some of them made me just laugh and others made me wonder why we're doing that at all. But I'm still the most perplexed over why the the... The itching one was the Peace Prize. I, I'm still... Yeah. Well, imagine if everyone in the world was itchy, how grumpy we'd all be. I, uh, no disagreement, but but we're not. That's not the that's not the case. <laughs> so I guess you've got to fit the studies into a category, and I and think there that's you go. probably what it was. They probably got to the end and went, "Oh no, we haven't got a peace prize." <laughs> hey, what peaceful things have been? Oh no, not really no. anything. Oh. <laughs> Well, it's all done in in the sense of uh, cheekiness, though. So it kind of it's all right. It is. It's a lot of fun. So that's all the awards, and that's our show. If you go to scienceontop.com slash 341, you can get more information about this year's Ig Nobel Awards. And as always, you can go to scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. It is always great to have you on the show, Peter Miller. Thank you. Is there anything you wanted to plug? Oh, no, not really. You know, people can go and look at my website if they like. I'm doing kind of all kinds of weird things at the moment, which is scribbletronics.com. I, I don't, I never do things like measure the temperature of testicles, but, you know, I do other interesting things. Well, you're missing out. Apparently. And <laughs> thank you for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. As you may know, we used to have a problem here at this ceremony. Many of the speakers would exceed their allotted time. Here's how we now solve that problem. Please welcome the charming, delightful, ever so cute Miss Sweetie Pooh.
Miss Sweetie Poo is eight years old. Miss Sweetie Poo, would you please demonstrate what you'll do when a speaker exceeds his or her allotted time? Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Now, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you, Miss Sweetie. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you. <laughs> what did we find in our research? We found that uh, analyzing data from a combination of uh, um, large Italian epidemiological studies, we found that people who regularly consumed pizza had a decreased the risk of digestive tract cancer and acute myocardial infarction. Our interpretation is that in Italy, pizza may represent a general indicator, a marker of uh, the Italian diet that has uh, other Mediterranean diets has been shown to have major health benefits. In conclusion, we recommend eating Italian pizza, but it should be Italian and therefore, but please, please hold the pepperoni for health reasons and also pineapple as a matter of taste. <laughs> The replication ballot, not an opera, just the ballot. A study once found that a pencil is a valuable research utensil. The procedure was used to make people amused and to show that a smile is extensile. Years after this shocking result, no reason was left to exult. Trying to replicate, some failed to get it straight. But after some serious thinking, the literature gave an inkling a chem caused a sham, producing much spam, and the proof was pretty convincing. Coda, if this story has a moral, it is to end a useless quarrel. To claim a finding is not real has a lot of sex appeal. But rather than insinuate, return to science and debate. Thank you. And now on behalf of the Harvard Radcliffe Society of Physics Students and the Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association, and especially from all of us at the Annals of Improbable Research, please remember this final thought. If you didn't win an Ig Nobel Prize this year, and especially if you did, better luck next year. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>